today on Let the Bible Speak. A little prayer meeting by the river turns into much more. Next on Let the Bible Speak. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Kevin Presley. And greetings to you on this Lord's Day. It's so good to be with you today. Thanks for joining me to study the Bible for a few moments together. We're in the midst of a series of lessons through the book of Acts we have entitled Jesus Saves, showing how the early church fulfilled Christ's great commission to preach the gospel to the world and bring men and women to salvation in Christ Jesus. Our focus is on the detailed accounts we're given in Acts of people's conversion to Christ. How were they converted and thus how are people converted today? What did the apostles preach and what did they tell people to do in answer to the question, what must I do to be saved when they heard and learned of Jesus? Well, today we come to another pivotal moment in the explosive growth of the first century church. We follow Paul and his company to the city of Philippi where the gospel is for the very first time preached in Europe. Now, several years have passed since Paul's dramatic conversion on the Damascus Road. He is now a devout follower of Christ and doing the work of an apostle. And as an apostle sent to the Gentiles, he is now on his second missionary journey with Silas, Timothy, and Luke. And the Holy Spirit will now dispatch them to the European continent where an open door for the gospel awaits and great things will happen. And when all is said and done in Acts the 16th chapter, one of the greatest churches of all time will have been established, a church that will be particularly dear to Paul throughout the rest of his earthly life and ministry. Read with me now in Acts chapter 16 beginning in verse 6. The record says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore sailing from Troas, we set a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Well, a small Sabbath prayer meeting on the riverside turns into much more than Lydia or those with her imagined. And we want to study their conversions to Christ today. In particular, this case raises a question that we'll address. What does it mean that the Lord opened the heart of Lydia? Does this imply some direct, inexplicable, miraculous operation of the Holy Spirit upon her heart? Well, we'll take that and more up in our study today entitled, Down to the River to Pray. And I'll return with that after a song. There are many, many things on the journey that I never could understand. They were far beyond my human conception, so it must be God's mighty hand. Many times. 
Our study today brings us to the conversion of a successful businesswoman in the ancient world along with her family. Some of the greatest people of faith are women, and that's always been the case throughout the stream of time. God has used women in a mighty way in His purposes and plans, and this is no exception. In this case, He established one of the great churches of all time on the faith of this godly and spiritually minded woman named Lydia. The Bible says that she was a seller of purple. And this tells us that she was likely a remarkable woman in the world of business who was successful in her line of work. Purple dyes were very costly in the ancient world, and generally only the rich were able to afford clothes dyed in purple. Kings, emperors wore purple. She was from the city of Thyatira and had ended up in the Macedonian city of Philippi in her business venture. Her success, though, in the business world did not cause her to compromise or forget her virtues and her faith. That came first in her life, and I believe that's evidenced by what the text tells us here in this story. She certainly believed in God, and now dwelling in a city filled mostly with heathen people, she was very careful to maintain her faith and her spiritual life. The Sabbath day meant nothing to the pagans of Philippi. It was just another day of business for them, but not with Lydia. As either a Jewess or a Jewish proselyte, she was very concerned with keeping the Jewish Sabbath. And so when that day came, she closed up shop and she attended to the things of God instead. Normally a Jew would attend the synagogue on the Sabbath, but there would have been no synagogue in Philippi. And so instead, the Bible says that she and some other women went down to the river to pray. Now once again, like those we've met in recent weeks in our journeys through the book of Acts, here is a person of virtue, morality, and holiness even, who was in a lost condition. Those things didn't save Lydia, you see. She needed, like everybody else, to hear and obey the gospel of Christ, just like every other person, religious or not, man or woman, rich, poor, moral, immoral, it doesn't matter. Salvation is only found in the gospel of Jesus Christ and through obedience to it. And this woman could not be saved until she heard, believed, and obeyed that gospel. So once again, God providentially goes to work to provide this sincere soul with the opportunity to hear the saving gospel. The Apostle Paul is now well into his ministry, and he's busy spreading the gospel. Since his conversion in Acts 9, he has now been received by the church. He has been prepared by Christ for the ministry. He is now on his second missionary journey visiting the churches he had planted along the way. He and Barnabas have gone their separate ways, and now he is traveling with Silas and a young preacher in training named Timothy. Now, Paul and Silas plan to preach as they travel west from Galatia into Asia and Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit forbade them from doing so. That may seem strange that a preacher on a preaching mission is forbidden from preaching by God, but that's because God had His eye on what was going on in Philippi with this woman, Lydia. And He is concerned with getting Paul, the inspired apostle, to her to tell her about Jesus Christ. So God, the Holy Spirit, intervenes. And He keeps Paul from stopping in Asia, and instead He points him further west where he ends up in the seaside city of Troas. And while at Troas, Luke, the author of Acts, joins Paul and his companions. And while they're resting there for the night, the Bible tells us that a vision comes to Paul during the night that we now know as the Macedonian call. The record says that a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with Paul in this vision to come over to Macedonia and help us to cross over the sea and to come to that new ground for the gospel and to preach to them. Well, Paul readily perceived that this vision was from God and he did not delay in obeying and heading for Macedonia, concluding that God had called them there to preach the gospel to the people. Well, great things would happen when he and the others arrived, including finding this woman, Lydia, and her friends down by the river praying and ready to hear the gospel from Paul. So they boarded a ship in Troas, and the Bible tells us in verse 11 that sailing from Troas we ran a straight course to Macedonia, and ultimately they entered the city of Philippi and determined to stay there and get to work. Now the providence of God is all over this. That phrase, we ran a straight course, means the wind was in their favor. Ancient ships which relied on their sails could only sail such a straight course if conditions were perfectly in their favor. And think about this, just as God counted off the exact footsteps of Philip on his way to that rural road where he found the Ethiopian eunuch. And just as God orchestrated the visions of Cornelius and Peter and synchronized all of that so that everything fell precisely into place to bring Peter to that Gentile household, 
So now the Lord of heaven and earth filled the sails of that ship with the exact wind it needed to sail right into that Macedonian port where Paul and company would eventually find their way into Philippi and into this Sabbath day prayer meeting where Lydia was gathered with her friends. Once again, God is seeing to it that the inspired person makes contact with the uninspired person who is ready to hear the gospel and a prime prospect for the kingdom of heaven. And I believe that God will move heaven and earth even today to provide every sincere person with the opportunity to hear the truth and be saved. Every chance you get to hear and learn the truth of God from His Word should be seized and it should be treasured as a sacred, a precious opportunity and should not be passed by or indifferently shrugged off or put off to some other time which may never come. Now normally when Paul went into a new city he would find a synagogue to go to on the Sabbath. That was his uh, strategy because it was a good place to find people who were willing to discuss and listen to the Scriptures and use that as a platform from which to preach the Christ of the Scriptures. It was the beginning point of his work in that city, but having no synagogue apparently to go to in Philippi, Paul does the next best thing. He somehow hears about a place out on the edge of town by the river where people usually went down to pray on the Sabbath. And this is where he finds Lydia's prayer meeting in progress and he finds a ready audience to share the gospel with. So the Bible tells us, beginning in verse 13, that on the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. Now this is an interesting phrase, the Lord opened her heart. What does that mean? How did the Lord open her heart? Now some contend that this proves that the Holy Spirit must perform a direct operation on the heart and mind of the sinner before that person can hear the gospel and be saved. The doctrine of Calvinism states that the unregenerate sinner is dead in sin and cannot respond to the gospel because he is dead in sin. According to their doctrine, he is uh, hereditarily depraved, born in sin, and born in such a condition that he, doesn't, he can't even hear and understand the gospel until a miraculous operation takes place in the heart of the one who is elected to salvation. That's what Calvinism suggests. But is that what is said here? Does this first go to prove that? Now the Bible says nothing here about the Holy Spirit performing such an operation on Lydia's heart. Notice it just says that the Lord opened her heart to heed the things that were spoken by Paul. It doesn't say that the Holy Spirit moved upon her in some operation of irresistible grace or a first work of grace, as it is called, whereby she could understand and receive the Word of God. It just says the Lord opened her heart to do what Paul instructed her to do. Now we have to be very careful that we don't make the passage say more than it says. Now there's no question that the Holy Spirit must affect one's heart for salvation to take place. We're certainly not denying that fact. No person can be saved unless he is taught and led of the Holy Spirit to be saved. But what does that mean? The question is not does the Holy Spirit play a role in man's salvation. The question is how does the Holy Spirit do that? Now let me ask a question here. If I use a particular tool or means to accomplish something, can I still say that I accomplished that thing? What if I say that I took a key and I opened the lock? Well, did I or did the key open the lock? Well, you would reply, well, you opened the lock by using the key. I didn't magically open the lock. I didn't perform some inexplicable operation upon the lock to open it. I took the key, inserted it, turned it, and the lock opened. In so doing, I opened the lock by using the key. Well, the gospel or the Word of God is the instrument of the Holy Spirit. Paul one time referred to it as the sword of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit revealed this Word and He uses that Word to do His work in the conversion of sinners and His work even upon the hearts of Christians unto sanctification. And when the Word does its work in the heart, it can rightly be said that the Holy Spirit did that same work. And it doesn't require some abstract, miraculous, and individual operation to do so. In fact, interestingly, everything, everything that the Bible says the Holy Spirit does upon the heart and mind of the sinner, the Bible also says of the Word which the Holy Spirit revealed. That's very interesting. It's very telling. 
When Jesus promised His apostles that after His ascension back to heaven that He would send the Holy Spirit into their hearts to empower them to do the work of apostles that He left for them to do, He said that the Spirit, when He came, would reveal the truth to them, to these apostles. That is, He would inspire them with the saving truth of the gospel so that they could perfectly preach it and write it down. And that by means of that truth, the Spirit, according to John 16 and verse 8, would convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Well, how did the Holy Spirit do that? How does the Holy Spirit do that? Well, we learned several weeks ago from Acts chapter 2 that when Peter preached the resurrection of Christ for the first time on the day of Pentecost, some 3,000 people who in their ignorance and blindness of heart had crucified the Son of God only a few days before, now when they heard the gospel preached, it says in verse 37 that they were pricked in the heart and said to Peter and the apostles, What shall we do? And Peter told them how to obey the gospel and be saved. And they did what Peter told them to do. They now understood the gospel. Why? Because Peter had preached it to them. There's absolutely nothing said there about some mystical direct operation of the Holy Spirit on anyone's heart that day. The fact is they heard the truth. They saw its credibility demonstrated by the apostles and they had a change of heart and they were convicted of their sins and they turned to Christ for salvation. The Spirit of God convicted them and taught them by means of the truth that He inspired Peter to preach that day. The same is true with Lydia. When Paul sat down and he began to explain the gospel to her, she now came to realize that what she had believed up until that point was incomplete and inadequate. She was like the other Jews looking for an earthly Messiah, an earthly king to come and deliver Israel. But now when Paul explains the truth, when Paul preaches Jesus to her, her heart is now open by the preaching of the gospel to act upon the things that Paul taught. The Lord through His gospel message opened her heart to the truth. She was not a godless, heathen, immoral woman. She was a sincere woman who did not understand at that point that Christ was the promised Messiah until Paul preached what the Spirit revealed to mankind to be preached. And when he preached that divine message, she could now see that Jesus was the promised Messiah and the Savior of the world. Thus the Lord's gospel opened her heart so that she eagerly acted on what she heard and she obeyed the gospel. And it's as simple as that. It is the hearing of the Word of God that creates faith, not a direct operation of the Spirit. According to Romans 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It is the Word revealed by the Spirit that leads to the saving of the soul. James tells us in James 1 verse 21, not some mysterious and explicable moving of the Spirit or some Calvinistic first work of grace. The Word has that power, the Word given by the Spirit. The Bible says that we are born of the Spirit, and it also says we are begotten or born again by the Word of God, which the Spirit revealed to the apostles to preach and write down. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. And when Lydia heard the Word of God preached to her, she was sincere enough to believe it and allow the Spirit through that Word to do His work in her heart and life and lead her to obedience to Christ, wherein she was saved. Now notice very carefully that the Bible says that when the Lord opened her heart, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now what did it mean to attend to things spoken by Paul? What did Paul instruct her to do when he preached Christ to her, when he opened through the gospel her eyes to who Jesus was? Well doubtless she believed what Paul preached. But it goes further and says she attended to the things that Paul said. So there was something involved in Paul's preaching that she attended to. When Paul preached Christ to her, it involved something for her to attend to. This once again shows us beyond the shadow of any doubt that responding to the preaching of the gospel includes more than mere belief in the mind. That belief, you see, leads to an obedient step of that saving faith. And here Luke tells us exactly what it is. She attended unto the things spoken by Paul 
by being baptized because that's a command of the gospel. Jesus gave it in the Great Commission. Go preach the gospel to every creature. That included Lydia here in Philippi. Go preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. Friend, baptism is not a church ordinance for new Christians. It is not an outward sign of an inward grace formerly received, as many suggest that baptism is. Baptism is a step of obedience to the preaching of the gospel itself. And here, just as in every other case that we have learned about thus far in the book of Acts, it was an immediate step enjoined upon every person who heard the gospel preached and believed it and wanted to turn to Christ in repentance and obedience. The book of Acts doesn't separate baptism from the hearing and obedience to the gospel. It makes baptism a part of obedience to the gospel. It makes it a part of the conversion of the sinner to Jesus Christ. And with that, this good woman and her family obeyed the gospel, and they were saved. She attended to what Paul said, and she was baptized. Now Paul and Silas' work, their, their work is not finished here in Philippi. Here we find a wealthy, pious, religious woman, woman learns the truth and becomes a Christian. And that begins, that lays the foundation for this congregation that will be established in this city. But next week, Lord willing, we'll meet a man of a different sort who also hears the word and becomes part of this new and wonderful church in Philippi. And the overarching theme of the gospel is seen. That people of every nation, every walk of life, man, woman, rich, poor, those from a devout background, those from a much darker background, that they're all brought together in the gospel and made one in Christ Jesus. And we're going to study the conversion of that man next week, the Philippian jailer. And this woman and her family and this jailer and his family, they will be the beginning of a wonderful church that Paul will hold dear throughout the remainder of his life. And we're going to take up the proposition in our study next time, what does it mean that the households of these people were as well baptized? Are we to infer from that that babies and infants, small children who don't yet have the ability to believe and repent of sin, that they are included in that number of those who were baptized? That's an interesting question that we'll seek to answer from the Word of God, and you'll want to join me for that. I'll be back to offer you a copy of today's lesson on the conversion of Lydia. But first, we hope you'll enjoy another song from the congregation.
Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. Be sure to join me next week when we will talk about The Jailhouse Rocked. Today, though, if you'd like a copy of our sermon, we'll be happy to send it to you. It's free of cost. Ask for the lesson, Down to the River to Pray, and we'll get it on its way. You can find us online, ltbstv.org. Follow us on social media. Subscribe to our podcast, our YouTube channel, all of those various platforms. We hope that you'll make contact with us and help us share them and spread the gospel to all that you know. We're thankful that you've been with us today. I hope you have a blessed week ahead, and I pray that you'll take time and make plans to join me back here next time for another Bible study. Until then, may God richly bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.